Your God is too small. If you believe that God doesn't answer your prayer, or worse, that God can't answer your prayer, your God is too small. If you believe that God doesn't take care of you, or worse, that God can't take care of you, then your God is too small. Let's be honest. If we worry at all, we're just saying that God doesn't care for us, that God doesn't hear our prayers. And so if you worry, your God is too small. God is big. God is strong. We believe that. And today, I want to share not just the way that we sometimes practically have a God who is too small, but some doctrinal systems that have a God that's too small. Some people have a belief that God is too small. And so today, I want to look at God's power. This is the third study in a series of 20 from the Apostles' Creed. We started with, I believe in God. I believe in God the Father. Now we come to, I believe in God the Father Almighty. This comes from the Apostles' Creed. It is not a formulation of, the, of what the Apostles wrote, but it's what the Apostles believed. And so you might want to read it with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This ancient creed is not inspired or inerrant, but it is an ancient and a valuable summary of Orthodox Christian belief. And so today we come to, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Hi, my name is Pastor Jeff Hartman, pastor of First Baptist Church of Troy, North Carolina, and this is the third study in our series on the Apostles' Creed, Your God is Too Small. I want to look at three different groups that have a, a too small view of God. Their God is not the God of the Bible as he reveals himself in the Old and the New Testament. And the first one is the pantheist. A pantheist believes pan all, that all is God. Pan as in pandemic, that is worldwide. All people are affected. Pantheism suggests that God and the world are the same. Here's the dictionary definition. The belief that God is the transcendent reality of which the material universe and human beings are only manifestations. The world and you and I are part of God, and God is a part of all of us. It involves a denial of God's personality and expresses a tendency to identify God and nature as one. Any religious belief or philosophical doctrine that identifies God with the universe. For instance, the force of Star Wars. God is not a force. God is a person separate from the world and separate from you and I. God is not everything and everything is not God. This is a major view in New Age teaching, sometimes in environmentalism, that the world or Mother Nature is all-powerful. But God is not the same as nature, and he is not the same as us. God is above God, and if you believe in pantheism, I'm telling you frankly, your God is too small. In the very first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1.1, we hear we have the foundation for all teaching about God. In the beginning, God, in those four words, we learn there is a God, and God is eternal. God was there before the universe. God is always. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so not only does it argue against atheism in the first four words, this verse also argues against pantheism because if God created the universe, God is not the same as the universe. He was before creation, and he is separate from creation. He is the creator, and everything else is his creation. In 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon is dedicating the new temple in Jerusalem. And in his prayer, he says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I've built. God, you're above creation. You can't be contained in these four walls, much less 
this, this world or the universe. God is bigger than all of that. Here he is teaching that God is other than creation, but more than that, he's bigger and greater than all creation. We look at this universe and it is breathtaking and we can't begin to fathom its hugeness, its intricacy, its beauty, its power. God must be more than that in order to be creator of this great universe that we live in. In the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verse 9, he says, Do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able, what is God able to do? God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. God is able to do things, in other words, that he hasn't done. Pantheism says everything that is, is God, and everything that God is, is everything, and that's all that there can be. It's every possibility, but God has a potential to do more than he has done. He could make two universes, or a multiverse if he wanted to, but the Bible told us he created the heavens and the earth, this universe. It tells us that he could have done other things, but he chose to do what he has done. And so pantheism is denied in this verse. Jesus tells us that God could have done other than he did. It's not inevitable. In a verse that is more well-known and more loved than Genesis 1-1, John 3:16, Jesus says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. These words are known and loved because it teaches us the heart of the gospel, that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, that we can be reunited, we can be reconciled to him, we can become his children through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. But it also teaches us about God. God is a person. God loved. Forces can't love. Things can't love. God loved the world and he gave his only begotten son, the incarnation of of the second person of the Trinity in Mary's womb at the Bethlehem's manger is God acting in creation. So God is personal and God acts in creation. Therefore, he is not the same as creation. Let me summarize this first statement against pantheism. To say God is the Father Almighty means that God is infinite without limits, outside of creation and not limited by anything in it. We are limited by our existence in this world. We're limited by time and space, but because God is outside time and space and not identical to the universe, he is omniscient, omnipotent. He is omnipresent, not limited by space. And he is everywhere all at once because he's not limited by the creation that he created. He is creator. And if you believe anything less than that, that's not the God of the Bible and your God is too small. The second group that we'd like to talk to is the liberal. The liberal says, yes, there is a God, and we learn about him in the Bible, but they reject God's omnipotence. They reject God's almightiness. For them, God is some old senile grandfather with his hands tied in heaven. He can't really do all that much. Here's a liberal book from my shelf, What Can God Do? by Frederick Sontag, a professor at a Christian school and in his book, What Can God Do? Might be better term, What God Can't Do. Let me read to you from the contents page, just some chapters. God is not able to reject anything. That's one chapter. God is not able to control those who represent him. God's not able to control someone. Another, God is not able to avoid evil. God can't create a world without evil in it. It's not God's choice. God couldn't help it. Great book by Harold Kushner. When bad things happen to good people, he, with his liberal view of God, says God is love, but there are some things that God can't do. God can't make a coin without two sides, so he can't make a good world where there isn't evil. God could have done otherwise, we learn from Jesus. He created a world in which good and evil coexist because he wanted us to have choice. This is not a perfect world, but it's the best possible world for God to have loving creatures in his image who are able to accept or reject his love. So Harold Kushner gets it wrong. His God is too small. God can do anything. As Baptists, Southern Baptists, we confess that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and all-wise. The Baptist faith and message, our official doctrinal statement for Southern Baptists, we say God is all-powerful. We reject liberalism, the liberals who say that God can't do this and God can't do that. He gave us the Bible, but it's not inerrant. It's full of myths. 
It tells us about seven days creation. God couldn't. God didn't create the world in seven days. God couldn't flood the entire earth. God couldn't send ten plagues. God couldn't have his son be born of a virgin. Of course, that's a part of the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God the Almighty who conceived Jesus in the virgin's womb. He couldn't raise Jesus from the dead, or he couldn't come back. Actually, the Bible tells us that God is omnipotent. Genesis 18, 14, God himself says to Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. God poses the question. This is God speaking, Genesis 18, 1. And he asks the question, rhetorical, is anything too hard for the Lord? Of course, he's asking it this way. Nothing's too hard for me, is it? And then he answers by giving a specific example. If I can conceive a child in the virgin's womb, Mary, I can certainly give a child to your aged wife, Sarah, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm not just going to tell you that I'm omnipotent. omnipotent. I'm going to show you. Job, in chapter 42, the end of that great philosophical book, he calls God Almighty. I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Notice it's not that God can do and God does everything. He can do everything or anything that he wants to do. There are certain things that God doesn't want to do, and that doesn't limit his power. He doesn't want to sin. He doesn't want to change his mind. He doesn't want to die. And so those things don't limit him. They actually are more of a strength. But at the end of the whole story of Job, Job admits, God, you are almighty. You are all powerful. You can do everything, everything that you want to do. We see in Jeremiah, he asks, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. How great is it? Outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Here, Jeremiah answers the question that God asked rhetorically in Genesis 18. Later, verse 27, he says, Behold, I am the Lord, the Lord God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? No, there is nothing too hard for God. God is almighty. Jesus says in Matthew 19, 26, he said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. How powerful is God? For him, there is no impossible. God can do anything he wants to do. In Luke chapter 1, verse 37, the angel says to Mary, she said, how can I have a child? I've never known a man. The angel says, with God, nothing will be impossible. Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. That's the positive. The angel puts it negatively. With God, nothing will be impossible. Two negatives makes a positive. Ironically, this verse is put right into not only the Christmas story, but the story of the virgin birth of Jesus. Liberal Christians, liberal denominations, liberal schools, liberal professors, liberal books say Jesus was a great teacher. He was a great man. Maybe even God came upon him, but he wasn't born a virgin. They even translate the Bible to deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. If God can create the world, couldn't he do it in seven days? If God can create Adam and Eve out of nothing, couldn't he create Jesus out of just Mary? They deny the virgin birth, and yet even in the story of the birth of Jesus, the angel says, God is all-powerful. He tells us that Mary was a virgin. She should know. And he says, with God, nothing is impossible. God, with a sense of humor, reminds the liberals who reject the virgin birth, even in the virgin birth story, that with God, all things are possible. There's a modern view today called open theism that rejects God's foreknowledge, God's omniscience. They say God doesn't know everything. He doesn't know the future. He can't know the free choices of human beings. And so they say, God doesn't know everything. In other words, God's not all powerful or all knowledge. But Isaiah 46, 10 says, God declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. Here is a statement of God's omnipotence. I can do whatever I want to do, whatever I want to do. Not I do everything. I don't do sin. I don't do evil. But I do what I want to do. But in the very first part of that verse, he says, I can tell the end from the beginning. Not just what I will do, but what everyone will do. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us he knows what would have happened if what happened didn't happen. He knows all possible outcomes, and he knows what free creatures will choose. Open theism is a rejection 
of God's, not only omniscience, but God's omnipotence, God's ability to do all things. This is found even in God's name. When we talk about God Almighty, that word in Genesis 17, 1, the first time it occurs, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. How mighty is he? He's Almighty. And walk before me and be blameless. That word Almighty is El Shaddai. El is God, Shaddai is Almighty. If you've heard that term El Shaddai, that means Almighty God. What does that mean? How mighty is God? I'm just simple enough to believe that all means all, and that's all all means. God is not some weak, distant God who can't do some things and is doing the best he can. God is all-powerful. A different word is used in the New Testament in Revelation 19.6. We know it from the Hallelujah Chorus. I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. You ever sing that one? For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That is the Greek word panto creator. And pan, again, all. God is all powerful. Pan means all. And to crater means powerful. God is omnipotent, which is Latin for all powerful. In his very word, El Shaddai is used 57 times in the Old Testament. The Old and the New Testament alike teach us that God is all-powerful. But I want to show you that logically, practically, there are some things that God cannot do, but not like this book and say God can't control this and God can't do that. I want to show you just to be clear, there are certain things that God cannot do, and I use air quotes, because God cannot do the ridiculous. People will say, well, that's impossible. Can God create a rock that's so big that he can't lift it? Is God so powerful that he can make two mountains with no valley in between? Well, we don't have to feel embarrassed to say, no, he can't, as if he was weak. No, that's a logical impossibility, a physical impossibility. And God is not limited at all by one of those ridiculous statements. This is one of those things where you can't win, right? If you stop beating your wife, you can't answer yes or no. Those ridiculous things don't prove anything, so we don't even have to bother with that. But I do want to suggest that it's also true that God cannot be tempted. Here, I'll give you the proof text. God is not tempted with sin, and he doesn't tempt anyone else, but God does not sin. He can't be tempted because he has no possibility of sinning. And so the Bible tells us that that is impossible for God, and that's not weakening God, that's actually strengthening God. We also would admit that he cannot lie, it says in Titus 1, 12, that he does not lie. As a matter of fact, it says in Hebrews 6, 18, it is impossible for God to lie. So the same book that tells us, God, all things are possible, it's impossible for God to lie because if God says it, then it's true. And if it wasn't true before, it becomes true then. Like when he says in Genesis, let there be light. There was no light, but when God said there was a light, there wasn't a lie. When he said it, it happened. God is self-consistent, and so he says what is true because God is truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. He also cannot change because he is eternal. He's unchangeable, immutable. So if he can't change, he can't die. It says in Malachi chapter 3, 6, he's not a man that he can change. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says the same thing about Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God cannot change and God cannot die. But again, that doesn't limit him. One more, he cannot deny himself, which comes straight out of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. To say that God can't deny himself is not a weakness. It means that he, is, he can't be cons inconsistent with himself. God is God, therefore he is what he is and he always will be because God is not a fallen, changeable creature like we are. But I want you to see that this is not in any way saying God is weaker because these are not weaknesses but strengths. To not be able to die is not a bad thing. To not be able to lie, to not be able to change, to not be able to be tempted, that's a great thing. These are limits that are found within himself. He's consistent with himself. They're not imposed upon him. I can't fly because of a weakness. I am constrained by gravity. God's not constrained by gravity. God's not constrained by time. He's not constrained by place. He's not constrained by the universe that he made. And so these are not weaknesses in God. 
These are actually strengths, and we ought to be glad that the God who has no weaknesses, the God who is omnipotent, is the one who hears our prayers and takes care of us. So to summarize this second section, looking at the liberal's incompetent God, let me say God is omnipotent over creation and not restricted from acting within it. God is all-powerful. He can do anything he wants to do. He is not a part of creation. He's actually over creation, and he is not restricted from acting within it. He's not separated from his universe. If he wants to, he can change the universe. He can answer prayer. He can do miracles. He can change things if God wants to. There's one more that I don't want to pass over. This one, I believe, is perhaps the most dangerous to Christianity today, and this is the view of fatalism. The fatalist God, they make fun of us saying that our God is too small because we don't believe that God does everything. But I would suggest that their God is too small. Here is the Westminster Confession of Faith. Reformed Calvinistic teaching teaches a fatalistic God. And they say right in the beginning of their confession, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. To put it shortly, God does everything. God accomplishes everything. Not everything he wants to do, God does everything. Now fatalism is actually a belief in an impersonal fatalism. This is a, a personal, a theological fatalism, but we live in a fatalistic world because there is no free will. God does everything. God gives us every desire. God gives us not the power to do things, but he makes choices for us. And so for them, every hurricane is directed at a certain place. Every tornado that hits a trailer park, God designed it to go there. Every cancer, every accident on the road is not an accident. It's foreordained by God. And so they create a God who actually does everything. Now, they would suggest if your God doesn't do everything, then your God is too small. And I counter, no, if your God has to do everything because he's insecure and he is not able to delegate free will to human beings creating his image, then I say your God is too small. In the Bible, we read Psalm 135, verse 6, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deep places. And they would say, see? God does everything. No, read it carefully. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. Did it please the Lord to create the universe in seven days? Yes, it did. Did it please the Lord to give Adam and Eve free will and a choice in the garden? Yes, it was. We see it right there in the first story in Genesis chapter 3. God gave them a choice, and they chose wrongly. Was that God's choice? Did God foreordain for Adam to sin? Then Adam did the will of God, and he wasn't sinning. So there's a real conundrum, right? God pleases, and then he does it. Where does an 800-pound gorilla sit? Wherever he wants, right? So where does God sit? What does God do? Whatever he wants to do, but not everything. To say that God does whatever he pleases is not the same thing as saying he does everything. The word sovereignty, used for God's control over everything, is meant to mean by a Calvinistic teacher that God does everything. God foreordains everything that comes to pass, your every sin, your every choice, everything that happens to you, no coincidences. That's not what the word sovereignty actually means. Sovereign comes from a king, and a king does whatever he or a queen does whatever she wants, but they don't do everything in the kingdom. They are ruling and reigning over the subjects, but the subjects have free will. When you extend that to God, we're saying God is over the world. God created the world. God is in control. But it doesn't mean that God does everything. Their famous proof text for God doing everything is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. This is the proof text next to that phrase in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Paul says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, determined beforehand, according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. They love those four words, who works all things. Does that mean that God chose for Adam to disobey his command? Does that mean for God foreordained Cain to kill Abel? Does that mean that God foreordained and made Peter deny Jesus three times, Judas 
to betray him, that God made Adolf Hitler murder six million Jews, that God chose not only the death of your child or the rape of your child, but the rape and murder of hundreds of thousands, millions throughout history, that God is behind all of it, not on your life. That is not what he's saying. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. He does what he wants to do. And one of the things that the Bible clearly tells us he wants to do is give us free will, either to do his will or to disobey his will. The Bible clearly tells us that all things are not God's will. For instance, we see in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, Paul writes, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Well, wait a minute. If God is not the author of anything, of one thing, then he's not the author of everything. And God's not the author of confusion. He's the author of peace. We could substitute God is not the author of evil. God is not the author of murder. God is not the author of rape. And if God is not the author of those things, if he's not the driving force, the choice behind it, then God is not the author of everything. It is not God's will that we create confusion in the churches. It's not God's will that we've been divided and at war. God chose for us to have a choice, and so that is sometimes our bad choice. We see in James chapter 1, verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. God doesn't tempt us, let alone he doesn't make a sin. That's what Calvinism teaches. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God doesn't tempt us, and by far, God does not force us to sin. Our choices are our wicked choices, and they're sinful, and we're responsible for them because we freely chose them. The Bible clearly teaches that we have a choice. Jesus says it in John chapter 7, verse 17. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He can say, if anyone wills what God wills for him to do, and God wills it, you don't. He says, anyone wills. That means you have a will to either accept Christ's gracious gift at the cross or to reject it, to either follow his word, obey him, and be blessed, or to disobey and to be cursed. We have a will. God has a will, and because we are created in his image, he gave us a free will. That's what makes us different than the plants and the animals. We have a free will like God to choose or reject God. And so Jesus teaches us right here, it was his pleasure to give us a free will. It tells us in Deuteronomy, I set before you life and death, therefore choose life, not wait around for me to give you the grace to do it. He says, you choose. Over and over and over again, the Old and the New Testament are a, a plea from God to please repent. I'm giving you the choice. I'm giving you opportunity. Please take it. It says in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. John Calvin and Fatalists theologically teach that our thoughts are actually God thinking through us. Our choices are actually God's choice through us. No, actually, our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Our choices are not God's choices. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. They're different. They're separate. And to a Calvinist, to a fatalist, our thoughts are God's thoughts. Our actions are God's actions. Everything is foreordained by God. They, they prefer a God who's in control. They prefer a God who does everything. I guess it's a lot more secure for us to know that someone is in control. Right now, a lot of things are out of control in the universe. There's confusion. That's because we have disobeyed the Lord, and the world is in rebellion against God. And I think they're happier having uh, an evil maniac in the driver's seat driving us over the cliff rather than having nobody. God is in control, but he has given us our own free will, and therefore we make bad choices, and we reap what we sow. We live in a fallen world, but that's because God loved us so much that he risked giving us a free choice to accept or reject him. Does God know everything? Yes. Is God control over everything? Yes. But has he given control over your own actions to you? He certainly has. And so the truth is that the, the God who has to control everything, has to make sure that every coin comes up 50% heads and 50% tails, rather than just allowing 
some things to chance. That God, that micromanaging, insecure God, is a God who is way too small to fit the testimony of the Old and the New Testament. The Old New Testament personal God, who's not some kind of absolute Greek God who's untouched by human feelings. No, he is one who loves us and gives us a choice. And so to summarize this third view, God Almighty is free and free to give us choice. He is free from sin. He did not cause sin. Adam to sin came to sin, out of Hitler to sin. He is directing creation, but not to create everything within it. Picture God, as the Old and the New Testament does, as a captain of the ship. The captain of the ship does not do everything on the ship. The captain has authority and is in control of the ship. But he's not in control of what every shipmate and every passenger does. He's in control of getting the ship where it goes. But everyone is responsible for doing their own job. And whether they forsake it or they do it faithfully, that's up to them. What the passengers do, what they read, what they choose to say. God is the captain of the ship who is guiding history and the world to a great ending. He is not in control of every little thing. If your God is that over-controlling, micromanaging God, I would say your God is too small. Is God great? Yes. Is he greater than us? Yes. Is he almighty? Yes, he is. We reject the pantheist God as too small, the liberals God as too small, and even the fatalist God, who they think is too, is big, but I would say is way too small. That's not the God who reveals himself in the Old and the New Testament. In the great children's song, Jesus loves me, this I know, it goes on that, um, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. How strong is he? Strong enough to create the world in six days. Strong enough to give his son to a virgin Mary. Strong enough to raise him from the dead. Strong enough to save you. Strong enough to hear your prayers. And strong enough to help you when you need it. That's the biblical teaching. He is strong. Let's pray. God, thank you for your power. We know that you are all powerful. But Lord, we don't blame you for our sin. We don't blame you for the things that go wrong. We're thankful for every good gift and every perfect gift which comes from above. Thank you for being all powerful and thank you for choosing to give us a choice so that we can accept freely your love. Lord, help us to not abuse that privilege. Help us to love you and to serve you because you are not only strong, but you are holy, not the author of sin, and because you are loving. For in Christ's name we pray, amen. Join us again next week for the fourth study in the Apostles' Creed.